Well, hey, good morning, Thrive Church. How are we doing today? I hope we ever take it for granted. Thank you, Nikki, for leading us in that song. Was that not incredibly powerful? Man almighty. We, we come in here each week, and I, I hope we never take for granted all the hard work that the band rehearses, the tech team, as they pull everything together. Uh, what we tried to do in today's experience is weave this theme of hope through the entire thing, because we are talking about something heavier. Well, if this is your very first time at Thrive, thank you for being here. My name's Jason. I'm one of the pastors here. Would love if you would take time to fill out that Connect card. Please, if you have prayer requests, we have a team of people that would love to pray for you. Drop it off uh, as on the way out. And if you're joining us on Facebook Live, thank you so much. If you're in this room, if you'd do me a favor and go to Facebook and share that on your page, that'd be absolutely fantastic so people can uh, join us that way. And if you're live, please go to the, con the online connect card. There is a place to do an online prayer request and to give. We would love for you to do that. Okay, let's just, let me ask you some questions. And this is just sort of the harder questions of life. Uh, have you ever felt like you were just in a tunnel with no end in sight? Uh, you ever just felt that there's just this haze in your life and you really can't seem to see your way through it? You ever just feel sad all the time. You ever feel like everything else and everyone else is moving so fast around you, but for some reason you, you can't experience that same pace that they are? You ever just feel like there's so much anxiety that it gets to like a place where you just, you just panic and then you find yourself like panicking over uh, really simple things in life? and difficult things. M maybe you've been to a place where you've panicked so much that now you're self-medicating. And so whether maybe it's smoking or maybe it's drinking or maybe it's drugs or maybe it's eating or maybe it's Netflix. I know it's just watching TV, but it's amazing now how we use Netflix to veg out on life, to veg out or Amazon Prime and Jack Ryan because that went pretty quick for me. Well, we're in week two of the series, When Life Sucks. And today we talk about how depression sucks. And I think about last week as we talked about divorce. And I, talk, I think about the conversation I had with somebody earlier in the week who said, I didn't come to church because I'm going through divorce and I don't want to be told by another person that I'm wrong. I don't want to be told by another person that it's just, you know. And so I said, oh, I said, please go back and watch it. Because what we tried to do is we tried to come after the angle of, okay, God has not abandoned you in this. And so this week, we're, we're gonna try to attack it. And, and we don't have, we, I wish we had so much time. We need to do a whole series on this. And the, the bummer is that like when we, when we teach up here, me or Dave or Dr. Tom or John or, or Stephanie or whoever, whoever is up, we only get to share 10% of all of the material that we've read and studied. And again, I probably watched 10 or 15 messages and have read articles and books and talked with many of you and talked the counselors. And, and so I hope that what we dive in here is a great starting place for you to find hope and to find healing. Because here's what we know in this series, life happens and oftentimes those happenings suck. I, I know we're not supposed to say suck in church, but they just do. We live in a broken world with broken hearts alongside of broken people. And it's inevitable that the areas where that brokenness overlap will create bad experiences or bad life moments. And so what we want to tackle in this series are the questions of how do we heal when we experience those bad moments? How do we cope? Where is God in all of this? Then in this series, we're going to we're going to tackle those tough topics. So if you didn't watch the one on divorce, please go back to our YouTube channel and watch it. Thrive Church MI on YouTube. Next week, we talk about debt. The week after that, we talk about death. Because here's the reality. Even in the midst of all of this, we know a God who provides hope and provides life and provides love. And so today we talk about depression. So, so whether it's depression, whether it's you're going through an incredibly tough season of life, uh, whether you've been diagnosed with depression, it sucks. And the reality is, is that many people can't understand depression. Uh, we often feel discouraged. We feel alone. We feel excluded. We feel insufficient. We feel crazy. And many people can't understand what people who are going, their loved ones going through depression can't understand what they're going through. And so they experience impatience. They experience frustration. They experience just, God, why won't you heal my family member or friend? 
And so here's what we know when it comes to depression. God is with you deeper than your emotions or your feelings. God is with you deeper than your emotions or your feelings. I know we're not like the loud, like, you know, like cheer after the pastor says something, church, but that alone deserves an amen. Like God is with you deeper than your emotions or your feelings. Amen. Like that's it. We have that hope. And our faith in God will hold you until your emotions catch up. And so if you're here this morning and you don't have a faith in God because you don't believe in God, I'm so glad that you're here. We're a church that exists for people who've given up on God or given up on church. I'm glad that you're here. Ask your questions. Wrestle with God. See what this is all about. If you have made that decision where you've trusted in Jesus and you've crossed the line of faith, your faith can hold you up. It can. And sometimes, though, there are very well-meaning Christians and not so well-meaning Christians who, if you're struggling with depression, will say things to you like, well, just stop sinning and your depression will go away. Stop being an idiot. I, I don't know, like, I don't, I, I mean, I, I guess that's, that's responding with rudeness. I apologize. But, like, the reality is, yeah, there might be unconfessed sin in your life that does probably or could result in some consequences in your life. There's a reason why God has guardrails for us in scripture to protect our hearts and to protect our bodies and to protect our emotions. That's why those guardrails exist. But to just say you're sinning, depression will be over. Sometimes Christians and churches, they view things as very black and white and it's just not that way. We need to take the wholeness of people into consideration. We need to take a wholeness of people into consideration. I love, I love what the psalmist said in Psalms 34. He says, is anyone crying for help? God is listening, ready to rescue you. Is anyone crying for help? For help, God is listening. He's ready to rescue you. We have to remind ourselves of that every day that we know a God who loves to rescue. He's in the business of redemption and he has this absolutely incredible love for us. And it's hard sometimes because you, you, wanna, you wanna be perfect, right? Like, you, you know, it, it hits me all the time. I watch my other pastor friends on Instagram or whatever, and I'm like, how come they're, everything's perfect all the time at their church? And look at them. They like walked off the magazine of a, you know, Abercrombie. I'm like, what, it, why, why? Like, what is happening? The reality though is like, everybody has their own stuff. Everybody has their own stuff. And, and I've been there. I've been, I, I, I can't stand in front of you as a pastor and say, well, I've never struggled with depression because I have. I've had ups and downs and ups and downs. I, I, I've, I've been through it. I've been through the gamut. And some of my stuff, like I've caused myself because of bad decisions. Some of my stuff I, I, is seasons of darkness and pain. One, one of those seasons was leading up to last summer, summer of 2017. I hit rock bottom rock bottom. I just gave and gave and gave and gave. I wanted this church to succeed so much that I, I tried to give 150% of everything that I had to this church just so it would succeed. And I love this church. I love you. But I, I, I didn't take care of myself. And I just went and I went and I went and I went and I went. And then things just started to like pile up and like the pressures of being a pastor piled up and the pressures of being a dad with five kids piled up and the pressures of the financial pressure of this church. Do you know that that thing really exists? Like we just don't exist unless we all like chip in. And so that pressure was like building up and people ask all the time, how come you don't have a building? Well, do you know how expensive buildings are? <laughs> like it's crazy, it, it's crazy. So all that, was, all that was building up. And twice I've told our elders at our church, listen, if you wanna go get like a real pastor, like I'm all for it. Like let's get somebody who like, and they're like, oh no, you're our pastor. I'm like, okay, whoo. Um, I'm like, whoo. But I got to the place so low last summer that I was like sit in the Meyer parking lot alone by myself. Gosh, I don't even think I've told you this. Um, I, I would just, I'd just sit in the parking lot and I'd just say, God, why? Like, why? Why all this pressure? Why all this pain? Why? Like, and I would watch somebody like push carts and I'm like, God, I want that job. Like, I want that job. My back can't handle it, but look how much fun they're having. They just pushed a cart. And if you're a cart pusher, I'm not, I'm not, this, I'm not, 
like saying anything offensive to you because God bless you. Like, I would, I would love to be a cart pusher with you. Like, look how fun that is. There's the carts, that's where they go. Like, that's it. Like, <laughs> it would be awesome. I bet they're not calling them when they get home at night. Holy frick, where's the carts? Like, pro probably nobody's doing that. That was not in the notes. <laughs> I apologize for saying holy frick. Uh, okay, let's just jump. <laughs> Oh, let's just jump in. So I know, I know, I know what it's like. And I actually went to our elders last summer. I said, I think I need some rest. And they gave me a month uh, and a mini sabbatical to take rest. And, and my job was to, to not think church because I had spent 24 seven for four years thinking church all the time. And so I just had to rest and I had to model it. And then some people were like, well, how come he does? You just have to model rest. And so I get it. I've been in those seasons. I've had family I've, I've had family who struggled with depression, like to the pain, to the point. Um, so I'm, I'm with you, I guess is what I'm saying. I'm with you and I'm there now and I'm, I'm with you and I get it. I know how much pain comes from depression and anxiety. So scripture gives us some incredible hope and there's a story in 1 Kings of a prophet by the name of Elijah who gives us some incredible hope when it comes to depression and anxiety. And so I'm gonna do my best to walk you through this story. This is what it says. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Just so you don't know, if you know who these people are, Ahab was the king, he was an evil king. He was actually the 19th consecutive evil king. And scripture says he did more harm than anybody else before him. So he, he's a bad guy. And at the end of his reign, he became a wuss. And he didn't want to be the guy who's calling out all the bad anymore. So he said to his wife, you get to be the bad. And so he tells Jezebel, like, take care of a situation. Okay, so then it says, so Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. She's so bad, she's going to kill him. So verse 3 said, Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life. He ran for his life. This is super confusing. Uh, if you need a refresher course on Elijah, let me give it to you really, really quick. Elijah considered, um, he, he, he saw God move in such crazy, powerful ways. Uh, the king had turned the hearts away from God and God sent the prophet Elijah to tell them, it's not gonna rain and pronounces this huge drought because of their hard hearts and it doesn't rain. The prophet's job in the Old Testament was, crazy hard. He had to go to people, he had to speak the truth, and he had to say, hey, you're not following God, so let's follow God. Sometimes people don't like it. <clears throat> so then Elijah goes into the season of hiding, where he's all alone, he's hiding, and even in the midst of that, God provides for him. So it's crazy. You got to read 1 Kings. God sends ravens that drop meat and bread, and then all of a sudden, this brook starts to come through and nourishes him. Then the brook dries up, and God leads him to a new place, and he meets a widow, and the widow has just a little bit of oil and flour. So he says, let's eat, and so the widow's like, okay. So again, God miraculously multiplies that little oil and flour, and there's enough for them. Then the widow son dies. And in the first time ever recorded in scripture, Elijah takes this lifeless boy upstairs and God raises him from the dead. God is faithful and he is good and he is powerful. And then God calls Elijah to go back to confront the king where the drought was. And so Elijah goes and he confronts the king. He says, hey, why don't you bring 450 of your false prophets of Baal, 400 of your prophets of Asherah, these are gods, and bring them to Mount Carmel, Mount Carmel and we'll have a showdown. And so they say, he says, we'll see who the real God is. This is just awesome. So they build a couple altars. And then they say, hey, watch, watch, you pray to your gods, I'll pray to my God for fire to come down. So it's like a crazy showdown. You gotta read this stuff. <clears throat> so, so the false prophets are like cutting themselves. They're like calling out to their Baal, who's not there, hello, and nothing happens. So Elijah starts to make fun of them, which is just kind of fascinating. And then God, he calls on God and fire comes down and burns everything up on the altar. And everyone's like, oh, 
what the heck is happening right now? So then Elijah goes to a mountain and he asks God to end the drought and send rain. And he prays for rain seven times. Interesting how that seven number just pops up all over scripture. And off in the distance, he sees a cloud the size of a man's hand. And in faith, he believes that it's a storm, a storm cloud is coming. And it is. And again, Elijah experiences miraculous provision. God's power, his protection, over and over for years. He's seen God's faithfulness over and over. Then one day, a woman says, I'm going to kill you. And he runs for his life. He panics. Like he sees the most powerful movements of God. He saw a boy rise again from the dead. Ravens fed him. Like, that's about as cool as going to McDonald's over there by the freeway. And you don't have to walk up to the line. You, don't have, you could just go up to that little, that, little, that little crazy machine and you can type in on the machine what you want. And they give you a number and you go to your chair and they bring it to you. That's about as crazy as like the crazy machine that my wife just bought for a house. It's called an air fryer. Do you know these things? Yeah. This is like sorcery. Like what, what is happening? The other day I put frozen meat in there, a bell dings and it's perfect. I'm like, what is happening right now? This is wonderful. Wonderful. So Elijah, 1 Kings 19, 13, he says, when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went on a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said, take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. <sighs> we do this all the time, don't we? We play the comparison game. We get to our lowest points and we're like, oh, if my life was like theirs, if it looked the, like, how do you get depressed like Elijah did? You ever been there? God, just take me home. Like right now, take me home. What can lead you to depression? This is not an exhaustive list, obviously, but from Elijah's story, we can see that when you wear yourself out, that can lead to depression. Elijah went and 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 it wore him out. It drained him. He shut people out. He shut people out. Like, that's exactly what Elijah did. He told a servant to stay there and he went on by himself. We do this all the time. We put up walls. We tell ourselves our friends could never understand what I'm going through, so I'm not gonna share it. This uh, last week, actually, I tried to convince myself to bow out of my own small group. I lead the small group, but I'm gonna bow out of it. Tracy was gone on a women leadership retreat, which was awesome. She needed to be there. I had the kids. We had some stuff going on at our house that made it a little extra. And then, you know, job and everything else coming at me. And like by Wednesday at four, I was like, I'm not going to small group. Forget that. Like, I'll just call in sick. Like, no biggie. You know, I was going to do exactly that to shut people out. And then I remembered, see, our small group, when we, do, when we get together, we do food. And we do meals. And they are good. And I was like, I think someone said they were making tortilla soup. So I'm going to be there. Um, <laughs> then we focus on the negative, right? Elijah focuses on the negative. He says, I'm no better than my ancestors. You know what happens? Self-pity exaggerates. It really does. I'll never get the promotion. I'll never get the A. I'll never get accepted. I'll never do the right thing. I'll never get a job. I'll never find someone. I'll never get healthy. And I've been there. I've said those things. We know those things. The negative just builds and builds and builds. And then how, what else? We forget God. We forget God. Elijah does this. He saw God move in supernatural ways. Yet he still. That's why the children of Israel all throughout the Old Testament, you'll see them setting up altars so they, rem they could look at that altar in years past and they know what God did. They remembered what God did. They would call them their Ebenezers. Like God, this is the Ebenezer moment where God provided. That's why we sing this song, do it again. God, do it again how you moved before. Do it again. Maybe it's medical. Maybe you have been to a doctor and the doctor says you are in a depression and you need medicine to help you. And for some reason, so many of us, like if we go to the doctors and we break our arm, we're like, no, 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 I don't need a cast. No, no, don't need, don't need that cast. <sighs> it'll, it'll set, it'll be fine. But, but when it comes to taking medicine to help us with depression, like we're like, we're like, oh yeah, no, oh no, no. Come on. 
Here are some practical, practical steps that we learn from Elijah to help in the times of depression. One, he says to Elijah in 1 Kings 19, five to six, he says, all at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. First of all, water doesn't go with cake, but all right, we'll, we'll go on. He ate and drank and lay down again. God says to eat and rest. Maybe the most spiritual thing you can do right now in this season of depression is just to rest. Is just to rest. Some of us, we spend so much time vegging out on our screens. It's like all day long. Every single highlight and we're, we're binge watching stuff. It's like boom, 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 boom. So much research I'm reading lately about how all of this technology, our brains aren't made to process that much information all the time. We have to have a rest. Do you know what solitude is? Solitude is purposely being quiet. You know why? So we can... This is not my quote. This is a very smart person. I'm not remembering who it is. I think it's John Orberg or it could be Dallas Willard, one of the two. But he said, solitude is when you take down the scaffolding in your life. And and because what happens in life is we just set up all the scaffolding, right? All the time. Like it's just, it, and we try to protect ourselves. And it's just, we take it all down and we just rest. Yesterday morning, I needed one of those moments. And so I went out to my spot in the lake and I just stood there and I just, I was quiet. And I just listened and I just, God says, maybe it's time to eat and rest. Then verse seven, the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, drank about the food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. You know this mountain? Many scholars, biblical scholars believe this is the mountain where God gave Moses the 10 commandments. You know Moses, right? Let my people go. Like, like Moses. Here's the crazy thing. He says, eat, rest, and go to the place where God teaches you and, and, and God is glorified. And I think that's a tremendous moment for us to go. So many of us, when these seasons come, you know one of the first things we do is we duck out of church. We do. We do. We duck out. I don't want people. Pe people. Sometimes people think that we all know what's going on with them. And so they walk in with like all this baggage. Like people are going to know what's happening. People are going to know. And we don't know. And this place just has to be a place where we welcome and accept and love people as they come in. I listened to this great talk this week. I put it in the, the private Thrive Facebook group. If you're not in it, uh, email info at thrivechurchmi.cc. If you're not on Facebook, I'm going to email this talk out later so you can have it. It's by a pastor by the name of Erwin McManus, who's one of my favorite uh, communicators on the planet. He's a pastor out in Hollywood. He's got campuses all over the place and just powerful. And this week, he and his son were talking about mental health. And it's just this amazing talk. And he said, life is going to feel out of control at times. That's why worship is so important. So, so like, yes, that singing part of worship that we just did, that's why it's so important. The reason worship is so important is because it helps process the healing. It aligns your priority right. But worship also creates a shift in responsibility. Do, do you know what, you know, some of you, like, so I, I worship with my hands up when I can. And, and man, it is, it is a struggle sometimes. Because I'm like, oh, you know, some people worship like this, some people... When, when, I, when, when I just release and, and worship God with my hands held high, it really does shift my, my mindset towards God. Because the problem is we walk in, we're stressed out, we're anxious, we're depressed, we're overwhelmed. And what happens sometimes in worship is like how we live our lives because worship is how we live our lives. We've kind of taken a, um, a vertical approach to God, which means that we carry all the responsibility. It's on our shoulders, it carries us. And when the rain and the storms of life come down on us hard, guess what happens? It just rains on us harder. And what needs to happen is we need to have, we need to have a, a shift of that. We, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. We, have, we, we, we carry it horizontally, so everything is on us, and we need to shift it so it's vertical. So like when the rain comes on us, it goes off like it's going off a roof because then it will water the stuff around us when we give to God. It's just this amazing process because God is deeper than our emotions and our feelings. So eat and rest. Two, God replaces our lives with his truth. This is huge. Verse nine, then he went to a cave, spent the night and the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? 
God wanted him to verbalize what was going on with him. That's why it's so important to talk to someone when we're in, in a state of depression or we're in depression or we're struggling with anxiety because we have to verbalize it out loud and help, have somebody else help us process it. Elijah replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, put your prophets to death with a sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Like Elijah thought he was supposed to do everything. No one understands, I've done it all. It's all been on my shoulders. And now I'm the only one left. Like, ooh, taking a lot on there. Like we're going to hear lies all the time in our heads. Lies, lies, lies. Second Corinthians 10, 5, Paul says, take every thought captive and make it obey Christ. Take every thought captive and make it obey Christ. Take every thought captive and make it obey Christ. Because you're going to experience lies. Here's the lies that I heard this week. Jay, you're never going to climb out. You're never going to be able to figure that out. Jay, you're never going to be able to do that. And we have a moment right then and there where we take those thoughts captive and we can replace the thought with God's truth. Sometimes what I do, and this is, I'm, I'm going to offend somebody, so I apologize, but I just say, F you, Satan. I know that's crass, I know whatever, but like sometimes the thoughts are so, I don't, I don't have time for this story, we're almost done, dang it. Um, uh, a long time ago, uh, my grandmother was killed in a car accident. I was 18 years old, and every once in a while, I have seasons in my life where my dreams consist of my kids or my wife, or my parents dying in a car accident. Or I have like a daydream thought of that happening. And so what I do when those thoughts come, as I say, F you, Satan, God is protecting my wife. He is protecting my kids. He's surrounding them. Then God speaks in a still small voice. First Kings 19 says, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake with a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. Sometimes we're at our lowest point. God seems to speak the softest. It may not be loud, but it will be enough. It will be enough. That's why we have to start making solitude a priority in our lives. So what I found from my life is when I'm battling these seasons where I don't know how I'm going to get through them, I try to go back to the basics, okay? Am I waking up and am I starting my day off in prayer with solitude? Am I filling my mind with God's word? And then lastly, God gives us something to do. First Kings 19 says, the Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go to the desert. When you get there, anoint the king. Also anoint Yehu, son of Nimshni over Israel and anoint Elijah, son of Snapchat from Abel Mahola. Not Snapchat, but Snap Hat. Um, <laughs> Shaphat, sorry, it's not Snap Hat. That's quite a, that'd be quite a name. Snapchat's in the Old Testament, Wow. But go back to what the prophets do. For some of us, like there is something yet for you to do. You feel down, you feel unsure, you lost your confidence. But guess what? If you're alive, God is not done with you. He's not done with you. And if you have moments where at your lowest, you want to take your life, can I just be one more person in your life to tell you that your life is valuable and it is precious? And if you have those moments, reach out to someone immediately, immediately, immediately. It's fascinating. Elijah's biggest fear in this scripture was that he was going to die. It was his biggest fear. He's going to be killed. He's going to die. God was going to take him. He's only one of two people in scripture to not actually experience a physical death. Scripture says a chariot actually picked him up and took him to glory. So many of us spend so much time worrying about stuff that we have no control over. Let me just say this real quick. If you've never been on the Thrive website, thrivechurchmi.com, there is a page that says next steps. And on the next steps, there is a page that says meet Jesus, volunteer, small groups. And then there's one that says care. When you click on care, there are four different boxes. You can give prayer requests, if you need a pastor to pray with you, if you need somebody to help you, if you need information about counseling, use this website. It's there. We would love to be able to help. I love this quote by John Mark Comer. Too much time spent in the past leads to depression. 
Too much time in the future leads to anxiety. So live in the moment. Live in the moment. Let me just give you a few additional thoughts. I'll go quickly. Find a Christian counselor. I know for many of us, the, the excuse is I don't have the money to pay for counseling. Then take it from somewhere else. Because if you're spending money on fast food or on Amazon or on songs on iTunes, you can use the money from somewhere else. And if, if you're at the, a crazy low point and you don't know how to get through, I'll give you the money. I'll, I'll figure out how to get you the money because you need, you need to meet with someone. Find a group of people who you can be with. Ed, educate yourself, read, sleep. Get at least one hour of sunlight a day. Take walk on your lunch breaks. You're not designed to be alone. Here's the crazy thing. Sometimes we're in these, these depression moments because people, these seasons because people have hurt us. And, and oftentimes, it's the people who hurt us or broke us, why we run the other way from people. But guess what? In God's plan, it's oftentimes people who he will use to heal us. That's why we can't run away from people. There's always hope. Don't listen to the voice that says there's no way out. God creates a way of escape. Even when we've created our own, our own maze, our own prison. Maybe some of you, you just need a seeing how do I word this? A seeing eye human who will help you see hope. Maybe you can't see hope anymore, so you've got to get a seeing eye human who can walk you around and see the hope that there is. Because remember, your life is precious. And if this is like going on for more than six months, you, you need to talk to someone. You, you've got to talk to a doctor, a counselor. You, you, you've got to talk to someone. Let me do this. Let's stand together. I'm going to do something as we end. Uh, just, a, just an exercise or a practice that I use in my life where those seasons of anxiety come. Uh, and so I'm going, to re, I'm going to read to you three scriptures and I'm going to email them later. So check your email box. But these are just three powerful scriptures that you can use during these seasons to just pray over and over and over and over and just to speak that truth into your minds. The first one, close your eyes and just listen to these words. It's from Matthew 11:28, 28 where Jesus said, are you tired? Are you worn out? Then come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover life. I'll show you how to take the real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. The next verse is in Psalms 31, 24. And it says this, be brave, be strong, don't give up. Expect God to get here soon. Just pray that throughout the day. God, today I'm going to be brave. I'm going to be strong. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to expect you to get here soon. And then lastly is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And I probably pray this 50 times a day. It says this, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him. And he will make your path straight. I pray, God, I trust in you with all my heart. I don't lean on my own stuff, but I, I lean on you, God. We're going to, as we leave today, we're going to have a time of worship. I, I've asked the elders and some of the pastors to come up front and they're going to be available if you need someone to pray for you as we leave. And I hope that you'll take this moment that you just won't walk by, but, but come and just be prayed over, be prayed for by somebody. If you know someone who's in this season or you're going through this season of life or you need help, come and be prayed over. And Matt and Helena and Nikki are just going to sing this worship song in the background, do it again. And we're just going to leave on, on this quieter note today because there is hope in Jesus. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, he has provided us hope. And there is hope today. And so as I pray, you can, you can quietly leave. You can come and be prayed for. You can, you can worship. And just if, if you need that extra few moments to just give it to God today, take it today. If you're brand new at Thrive, before you leave, we have this thing today called the After Party. We'd love to meet you. Love to give you more information. That's on your way out. Let me pray for you. God, we just come before you right now and we thank you for this time together. God, we just pray in the name of Jesus that, that you would meet us in our, in, our, in our state of despair, God. You would meet us in our state of darkness or our state of hope or our state of anxiety or our state of panic, God. 
We just pray, God, that you would help us to be brave, to be strong, to, to not give up, God, but to expect that you'll get here soon. Jesus, you told us to come to you, so we're coming to you, God. And we're asking for your help, Lord God. We're asking for your help. God, we pray for healing. And we pray for your help. And we ask this in your precious name. Amen. Know this, Thrive Church, you are loved, and we're praying for you. Let us pray for you before you leave. We'll see you next week.